when I measure this AA battery with my meter, I should get roughly 1.5 volts. And there we go. And of course, if I flip it around, then I get minus 1.5 volts. And similarly, if I charge this capacitor to 9 volts using this 9 volt battery here, let's just charge that up, connect it on. This is positive terminal here. Okay, that's charged. Put my meter across it. And I've got roughly 9 volts. Do the same again, charge it up. Okay, but this time flip it around, then of course I'm going to get minus 9 volts. And using the same technique, this little IC here will give you an inverse of whatever your supply voltage is. So on this breadboard, you can see I've got 5 volts coming in here. And the output of this IC, you can see I've got minus 5 volts. Brilliant. Now this is actually a follow-up video to my operational amplifier video I did and in that video I gave some options how you can create a negative supply rail for your op amp and I, one of the options was using this chip the 7660S and one of my viewers suggested that it'd be a good idea to do a follow-up video showing how this works so let's take a look. So the simple negative converter then, using this 7660S chip. If you look in the data sheet, they've got this rather handy sort of representation of how the circuit works. Let's take a closer look at that. So over here, you've got a square wave pulse coming in, and that's actually internal within the chip. It generates its own clock, and that clock is controlling these switches, S1, 2, 3, and 4. So you can see here, you've got a NOT gate. So basically, when these are closed, these two will be open. And when these two are closed, these two will be open. Now, in reality, these are not physical switches, as it shows here. They are transistors or MOSFETs. So this is switching fairly rapidly. In the middle here, we've got our capacitor. And that's what we're going to be charging and then flipping around and then charging and then flipping around over and over to get our negative voltage. And these numbers here, well, they just represent the pinouts on the chip. So I'll add them in there. This is your voltage in here on pin 8. Your cap plus positive terminal of your capacitor goes to pin 2. Pin 3 is ground. Pin 5 is your output. Pin 4 is the negative terminal of your capacitor. And pin 7 is an optional oscillator. I'll come on to that in a while. So just remember these switches are controlled by this pulse. But for the time being, I'll get rid of all of that cumbersome mess there just to clean it up a bit. So let's assume we're powering this at 5 volts. And to start out, we'll have S1 and S3 closed. And to make this nice and simple to follow, let's just put a bit of color code in here. So red will represent my five volts, green will represent zero volts or ground, and blue will represent when we've got our minus five volts. So we switch one and three close and two and four open, then all of this will be at tied to five volts here. So the, that plate on that capacitor will be charged to five volts. And all of that shown in green there, well, that's tied to ground. You've got a ground connection here, going through that switch which is closed, so all of this is ground, 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 ground there. So the plate on this capacitor is ground and the other side of this capacitor is also ground. So with that connected to ground and that connected to 5 volts, that capacitor will charge very rapidly to 5 volts. And also bear in mind that the plate on this capacitor here, this side, is tied to ground. It's permanently tied to ground actually. And now on the changing edge of the clock cycle, then S1 and S3 will now go open and S2 and S4 go closed. So therefore, this now is ground up here. It's connected to pin 3 through this switch here. That means this capacitor, which was charged to 5 volts, this side of it is now actually referenced to ground. So if this is 5 volts higher than this and this is 5 volts lower than that, now, given that this is now our ground reference, then this down here is our minus 5 volts. And that minus 5 volts there, shown in blue, obviously connects right through. And this capacitor kind of acts as an output reservoir for our minus 5 volt supply going out. And this type of circuit, where you chop and change the orientation of the ground across this capacitor, is sometimes called a floating capacitor circuit. And let's just compare this circuit with the block diagram that's also given in the data sheet, actually. So there's your four transistors. Look, these are MOSFETs. So Q1 and Q3, that is those two switches there. And then Q2 and Q4, that is those two switches there. OK, so Q1 is a P-channel MOSFET. All the rest are N-channel MOSFETs. 
This is where the uh, internal clock is generated, or you can connect up your own clock on this pin seven if you want to. But do bear in mind that this is a divide by two. So we'll see that on the scope later. It's divided by two internally. Uh, there's an internal supply regulator, which you can override with that LV pin, which we did discuss just now. And these two together, well, they're regulating the switching of these transistors. Over here, that's the capacitor that you're flipping backwards and forwards to get your negative supply, uh, positive supply, ground, and your output. So now let's just have a look at the wiring arrangement then using this chip as a simple negative converter. And here it is. So let's just add the pinouts as I did before. So pin eight, you connect to your supply rail, your positive supply. Pin three, you connect to ground and you put your capacitor across pins two and four. Pin two being the positive side of your capacitor and pin four being the negative. Then pin five basically is your output and you must put your second capacitor there. So if you're using a electrolytic capacitor, then the positive actually goes to ground in this instance, because bear in mind this negative terminal is actually connected to your negative supplies. If you're running this at five volts, this would be minus five volts and that would be zero volts. And just in case you're wondering what these other pins are for, let's quickly go through them as well. This boost pin, while well, that increases the internal clock frequency from approximately 10 kilohertz up to 35 kilohertz. By increasing the frequency, of course, you're charging and flipping this capacitor much more rapidly, and therefore your output impedance will reduce. The LV pin you should tie to ground if your supply voltage is less than three and a half volts. That will bypass the internal voltage regulator. And this optional Schottky diode here, this is what the data sheet says. If the input voltage is higher than five volts and it has a rise rate of more than two volts per microsecond, then an external Schottky diode from V out, which is there, to cap minus, which is there, is needed to help prevent the latch up, basically. And pin seven, or OSC, standing for oscillator, this is what the data sheet says. The oscillator, when unloaded, i.e. nothing's connected, oscillates at a nominal frequency of 10 kilohertz, as I said over here, for an input supply voltage of five volts. This frequency can be lowered by the addition of an external capacitor to the OSC terminal, or the oscillator may be overdriven by an external clock. Okay, so that covers how this thing works and how you wire it. So now let's go back to the breadboard and have a closer look at it. So there you go, that's the 7660S chip there. So pin eight, I've got connected to the supply rail, the positive supply, which I've got coming in as five volts. Pin three goes to ground, which is there. Then between pins two and four, I have the capacitor. So that's the capacitor there, you can just about see. Between two and four, three of that's ground. And what else? And then I've got, this is your V out, which is pin five. My 10 microfarad capacitor going to ground there. This is the positive leg, by the way, as I said. And the negative leg of the capacitor is going to your V out pin. And I've just put a little jumper lead across there so we can measure the output easily. And just to verify, you can see I've got five volts coming in here and minus five volts coming out here. Brilliant. Now, one of the key things to bear in mind with this is you cannot draw a lot of current from it. If you need, say, more than 10 milliamps, then this is probably not right. But for a lot of op-amp installations that I've done, this has been perfectly fine. It's all I needed. So what I've done now, I've, I've added a potentiometer so I can adjust the amount of load on the output. So that's going to ground over here. I've added this meter, which is in a milliamps range at the moment. And let's go. that's also in series with the output through there. And I'm sniffing off the voltage on this meter. So I'm currently at virtually no load and I'm at minus 4.9 volts. So now if I crank the potentiometer up and then increase the current, then you can see on this meter, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 milliamps, 0.5. So what we at there. So one milliamp ish and I'm down at 4.921 volts. Let's go up a bit more. Now like you can see this drop it more increasing because it was negative voltage we're talking about, remember? So let's try and get it to around 10 milliamps. And there, yeah, you can see, look, minus 4.2. So let's get it to say five milliamps. And there, four point, minus 4.6. So just bear that in mind. 
bear in mind also you can actually parallel these devices up so you could put more than one of these circuits in parallel with each other and you could drain a bit more current that way also you could connect pin one the boost pin to your supply rail and that that will increase the internal clock frequency to 35 kilohertz roughly and that way you're charging this capacitor more regularly and you would reduce the output impedance a bit so what I'm going to do now is connect this up to my oscilloscope and we'll have a look at how it performs. So first of all, I've removed my bench power supply and I'm going to power it from this battery using a 5 volt regulator there just to eliminate any noise coming from my bench power supply. But this is on a breadboard anyway, so it's far from ideal. So first of all, I'm going to connect my yellow probe to the output pin, pin 5 there. Can that stay? And my blue probe, I'm going to connect to the positive leg of that floating capacitor there okay and then just connect the grounds up right there you go i've got the probes in now and got the ground connected so let's fire it up on there so we've got power so yeah i'm draining 4.7 milliamps let's jump over to the scope and see what we can see right there you go i'm triggering on the blue trace there as you can see and that is the probe that's connected to the floating capacitor on its positive leg so that's pin two on the chip. Now I'm at two volts per division here, so two, four, five volts, that's my five volt switching. And if I turn on channel one, that is the connected to the V out, the output pin or pin five. So that's our minus five volts coming out. And the charge and discharge, okay, it's, it's discharging all the time because my load is constant on there, but it's got a charge cycle as well in amongst that. That's you can see is in sync with the blue trace. So you can see it's going with the switching of that capacitor flipping backwards and forwards. Now, when I first looked at this, I thought, okay, that's it charging there and this is it discharging. But um, no, because remember, this is minus five volts. So it's a negative charge we're applying to it. So actually, this is the charge here and this is it discharging. Um, so let's just go and invert this. There we go. So that should be more representative in your mind. So that's it charging up to minus five volts. And then when it's not charging but still got the load, of course, then uh, it's dropping back down or up. <laughs> and uh, yeah, then it goes again. So that is telling me we got a frequency of 4.49 so remember it's divided by two so that's roughly the the 10k that they said let's now connect up that boost pin boost uh, pin one to the supply rail and we should get what is it 35 kilohertz that should increase the clock so let's do that yeah there you go you can see the clock timers definitely increase there so um let's just zoom that out a bit now so this is telling me 15.62 something so well over 30 kilohertz because remember it's divided by two so that does indeed work uh, has it done much that you can see it's now charging much more rapidly and i think there's there's less drop on it now so that should give us a little bit more current because the output impedance will be a bit lower and just to show you the extent of this output ripple that you're getting on here, well, that's really governed by the amount of load you put on the device. So I'm currently up what, about 5 milliamps. If I turn that down, you see that the ripple almost disappears. And if I go back up and put more load on it, then yeah, it's discharging much more heavily. So got to charge again. Yeah, that's it. so it's not great at higher currents. So as long as you're down at a few milliamps, then it's absolutely fine. As always, the data sheet is the right place to look to get all of the useful information about the products you're, you're dealing with. And this data sheet gives you quite a lot of useful information, actually. I've highlighted a few key points for me, so let's just run through some of them. Uh, supports an input range of 1.5 to 12 volts. It, you can use it as a voltage doubler. The circuit is below. I'll come on to that. But it will support voltage doubling to generate up to 22.8 volts with a 12-volt input. Uh, there's the pinouts, the uh, skews there, a few more specs. Uh, the output source resistance, so at 20 milliamps drain, uh, then the output resistance is 60 ohms, they claim. And the oscillator frequency we saw, so with pin one open, the, the boost pin, or tied to ground, then it's nominally 10 kilohertz, and we roughly got that. 
with it tied to your supply rail, then it's 35 kilohertz. Okay, more specs there. This was the functional block diagram, which is useful. Load of curve charts there is typical. Uh, more circuits there. That is the idealized negative voltage converter, which really helps you get your head around how, this, how the circuit works. 0.6 here I've highlighted. Oh, that's the Schottky diode. If your input voltage is uh, higher than 5 volts and yeah, has a rise rate more than 2 volts per microsecond, then they recommend you put that Schottky diode there to keep it more stable. Uh, you've got calculations here for your output ripple. You can parallel the devices, as I, as I said, and the purpose of that would be to reduce the output resistance and allow you to draw more current without the voltage dropping, basically. You can cascade them to give you a bigger negative output multiplication. And a few more circuits. There's the voltage doubler there. And what else have we got? And you can split the supply in half as well, which is quite useful. So that is the 7660S voltage converter then, which you can use to provide a simple negative converter. And just by adding a couple of components, you can get yourself a negative supply rail. Yeah, it's got its limitations in terms of the amount of current you can draw for, from it, but I've used it quite often and has got me out of trouble. So I hope you found this video useful. If you did find it useful, please click the like button. And if you haven't done so already, please click subscribe too. All right, catch you later.